This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. All right, look, Jesus is not going to return at any moment. He can't. Certain things must take place before we will see the second coming of our Messiah. It's not an opinion, it is written. And what is written is law, especially when it is written by the Almighty himself. So what must happen before Yeshua returns? And what must believers endure in the meantime? Tonight, Michael Rood gives you a true rude awakening in the first episode of a new series that reveals what happens next, the mystery of iniquity, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Countless thousands have read Michael's book, but now you get to be the first to see the all new series that explains in further detail what must happen before Yeshua returns. The Mystery of Iniquity. This is a groundbreaking series that you need to see, that your friends and family need to see as well. So gather around and get ready for episode one coming up in just a few minutes. And by the way, happy Hanukkah. There's still a few days left in this annual celebration of the Maccabean Revolt, and that is seen on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see on your screen there. Uh, now you may be seeing, uh, saying that you've seen Hanukkah celebrated at a slightly different time than other folks you know, or maybe something you saw on TV or online kind of doesn't line up here. So why do we celebrate Hanukkah according to this calendar? Well, let's talk about that with our Director of Ministry Development for Arud Awakening International, David Robinson. Welcome, David. It's good to be here. And now yeah, that, I'm glad it. Yeah, now the, uh, the, the calendar, you know, we, people always say, well, why do you have a separate calendar? And, you know, Michael uh, Rood is all about timing because yeah. he says without uh, proper timing, there's no cause and effect. We can't see why Yeshua did things on a certain day. And so timing really matters when we're talking about uh, biblical truth, really. It does. And I mean, that way we know uh, the biblical timetable and we can know the season, maybe not the exact day, but because of, the, of, of the, all the hard work that Michael's done to develop this calendar, we can see what's going on, when it happened, and when it's gonna happen again. What right, and now Hanukkah, pe people might say, well, this has nothing to do with, with uh, Yeshua and his life, but actually it does, because this is when, uh, we, we can line up when uh, he was born, uh, right. at the Feast of Tabernacles, the first day of Feast of Tabernacles, we know that, and that makes sense, doesn't it? it? Because does. God says that uh, he wants to dwell with his people, and what better way to do that than be born then, as a baby? That's exactly right, and it's gonna be a big shock for everyone if you uh, don't know this, but Yeshua was not born on December 25th. Right, <laughs> I'm hoping if you've watched this, any kind of program from Shabbat Night Live, you know that. That's exactly right. Uh, but this is the time that uh, when Ga uh, Gabriel mm -hmm. uh, told Mary, or Miriam, uh, Gabrielle, Gabrielle, more properly, told Miriam that she would be bearing uh, a son. That's right. And uh, she was so excited, she went to visit her cousin, uh, which is known as Elizabeth, in, in right. English, uh, Elisheva. And this is when she was also pregnant with John the Baptist. That's now right. this is how we know when John the Baptist was born. Uh, and so this all seems to line up it and does. that's an important part of Hanukkah. And we actually have a hint of Hanukkah in the Bible where it says that uh, the, the disciples were gathered on Solomon's porch. That's right. And the only reason you gather on Solomon's porch was for, for Hanukkah. Hanukkah because sure. that's where they celebrated this thing. So, uh, you know, timing really is everything and it, it helps us understand. People say, well, still, I don't see the point. Well. The point of lining all this up is that you get to see uh, when Yeshua was born, when he died, when he's resurrected, and then when he's coming back again. And by doing that and, ha and seeing that it literally lines up to the day of when these feasts are celebrated, we get to understand that he is the feasts. That's exactly right. It's, I, like I said, I think it's really important that we know these things because what does it do? I mean, how often have we... Uh, just use the scripture to try to defend our faith and people go, well, you're just using a biased book here. Mm -hmm. And now we can actually use data from NASA and uh, to line these things up and actually use science to show that the Bible is true. Mm -hmm. that these things actually happen and we know exactly when they happen. And even if people still dis uh, dispute it, 
you begin to see the series of events and the lining up of you know when a, a new moon happened mm -hmm. or where the stars were lined up, especially with Yeshua's birth. Right, exactly. that's crazy. If you've ever seen how the stars were lined up when he was born, and of course that's with the men, uh, the uh, the wise men, so, so to speak, from the east, the astronomers, mm -hmm. as Michael will correct everyone who says that they're wise men. Right. Well, they're actually ast astronomers. Um, and to, to have all those things line up at the perfect time is like one in a you know, 10 billion chance or something like this. Exactly. To have Yeshua's birth line up, everything he did line up perfectly. Uh, and you, you, it even takes away any kind of speculation that, oh, well, he, he manipulated these things to make scripture happen and right. make him look like he was the Messiah. There's no way. The further you look into this, there's just no way that that happened. Yeah, I agree. Now. December, we, uh, let's talk about our Gregorian calendar. That's every, right. Every Gregorian calendar, we have a new love gift for you, and this is the last opportunity to get the December love gift, and that is called Trouble in Ephesus. Now, this is a new teaching by Michael. It's only available to those who uh, decide to bless this ministry with a donation of $50 or more through mm -hmm. our love gift program. And this is a gift in return from Michael to you. It's, uh, it's all about Paul's trip to Ephesus and why did he go to Ephesus? I've never actually heard it uh, the way Michael talks about it here. Mm -hmm. um, when Paul went to Ephesus, that was a really big deal because this was the center of idolatry to the goddess uh, Diana. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is basically uh, the Greek's version of Easter. Right, uh, and so and she was a fertility goddess, and the the statue that you see depicted on here, uh, if you see the whole statue, you begin to understand why she's the goddess of fertility. There's, mm. uh, you know, so this was in the center of Ephesus, and uh, he, he, you know the believers in Ephesus had a real hard time with this because they're like, well, we've been worshiping Diana, and now you're telling us about this. Hebrew Jesus or Yeshua, mm -hmm. what are we supposed to do with this? And we have all these idols in our house and several of the believers who actually believe Paul um, made the likenesses of, basically they, they sold trinkets mm -hmm. of the goddess of Diana. So you can imagine the upheaval this caused when he went there. Yeah, it had to, it had to. I, I really look forward to looking at this teaching. Yeah. Usually we have a chance to look at it. I haven't had a chance, so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing now, this. Now David, you're, you're heavily involved <laughs> in, in helping uh, the ministry choose what gifts we give to folks for mm -hmm. in, in appreciation for their support. Uh, there's something here we called a God's uh, Promises. What is this all about? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, there's uh, like a hundred, I think, uh, promises mm -hmm. in here. And, you just, uh, they're on a card. So uh, for instance, this says, peace, I leave, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do. I give to you. Let, <laughs> I need my glasses. <laughs> Let's not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Okay. So uh, anyway, there's promises in here. And, and I, I was telling Scott before, the, before we started filming this is, men, you wanna really move your wives as the spiritual priest of your home? Take one of these cards Get this, and then take one of these cards and set it by her nightstand, or put it by her coffee. Oh, and oh just like, put a little note. Yeah. like if you leave the house before she does, you kind right. of leave it by. Oh, yes, yes, that's yes. A good so, idea. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful glass, and um, it's kind of got a bluish tint to it. Yeah, it, it's and a heavy little thing. It too. is I mean, heavy. It's it very, is heavy. very uh, mm -hmm. high quality. Now, it's something else we have behind here. We're not going to. I'm going to move the the teaching so we can see this, but it's a breadboard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's solid wood. It's. Uh, um, I was gonna say stainless steel, it's sterling silver. Ster sterling silver, there. Yep. And it's, now you know that the inscription, you had it written down, what does it say uh, here? Remember the holy day okay. and honor the Sabbath. Okay, and, it's, and it also comes with a bread knife in there, kind yes, of slid in. it's a beautiful board. And it it's really beautiful is. to bring out uh, for special occasions like Shabbat, a spe, you know, a feast that we mm -hmm. get to do every week. And again, this is uh, the last opportunity to get this after December 31st. I mean, it's not available, it's right? It's not available, okay. ever again. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, David. It's been great. All right. Well, before uh, before we get to the teaching in just a few minutes, uh, Michael starts an all-new series tonight based on his best-selling book, The Mystery of Iniquity. Many people have re uh, read it. And uh, when friends and family ask you why you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture and why Yeshua or Jesus cannot come back at any moment, this series has all your answers, so stay tuned. And up next, uh, get your bread and wine ready uh, to bring in the Sabbath with the Kiddush with Michael Rood, coming up next. As he ministers in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul finds himself surrounded by a rioting mob, bent on protecting their pagan traditions. Our world today is no different. And this is exactly what Paul is teaching. He's teaching the Gentiles to not forsake Moses, but forsake all of their paganism and come back to the truth. That is Israel's job. That has been Israel's job from the very beginning. 
Trouble in Ephesus by Michael Rood offers a sobering parallel to the pagan traditions of modern Christianity. Get this teaching as a thank you from Michael Rood when you give a love gift donation of $50. Donate $100 or more and you'll also receive over 100 of the Bible's most encouraging promises kept in a beautiful glass case. Or for a gift of $300 or more, you'll receive it all, plus a solid wood and silver-plated hollow bread cutting board with an engraved bread knife. Get these gifts now while supplies last. Donate by phone or visit monthlylovegift.com. The Chronological Gospels Bible is changing lives all over the world, putting everything the Messiah did in exact chronological order and explaining the behind-the-scenes truth of what the Messiah did, when He did it, and why the timing of it all means everything. And now, the Chronological Gospels can be easier on your eyes. The larger print edition features 40% larger type, and every page appears exactly the same as the original, so you can follow along with others who have the regular size version. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition also has wider margins to write notes, and the premium quality paper means you can highlight without soaking through. Plus, the larger print edition lies flat, so you can teach without having to hold the book open. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition is a big and beautiful coffee table book, measuring a full 12 inches tall and 9 inches wide. Study the Bible with clarity and ease. I love the size of this book. This is nine by 12. The paper is, is perfect because it doesn't bleed through when I write on it. I can mark it up and I always make notes in all my Bibles. Everything is the same place as it is on the smaller version and I can just stand back and I can teach from it and it's just, it's the perfect size. I pray thee, of whom speaks this prophet? Order the Chronological Gospels larger print edition by phone or online. You'll get 40% larger type than the original. Call 800-788-7887. That's 800-788-7887. Or get the Chronological Gospels Bible larger print edition online at arudawakening.tv slash large. The traditions of modern Judaism remind us of what we did during the temple period. Not what we did, but they remind us of what we did. But the followers of Yeshua also have some other traditions, some other things that are reminders of what has been accomplished for us. They are reminders of what goes back long before the temple period, and it reminds us of what happened the very year that Yeshua was crucified and resurrected. At the Last Supper that Yeshua had with his disciples, the Greek scriptures tell us that he took our tone. He took leavened bread and broke it. Of course, the English, the Greek, and, and all scriptures tell us that this Last Supper was before the Feast of Passover. And the following morning, the Pharisees refused to go into Pilate's judgment hall because they didn't want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. This is not the Passover meal. And every time we serve bread and wine gives us the opportunity, as Yeshua says, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And so, as Yeshua said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood. And he spoke the prayer that the Melech Zadik shared with Abraham thousands of years ago. Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah our Elohim, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua took bread, and he blessed the Most High, saying, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah our Elohim, King of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth. As often as you do this, we do this in remembrance of him. L'chaim.
The Mystery of Iniquity. I wrote this book 24 years ago before moving to Israel as my confessions. My confession that I had been teaching heresy, that I was biblically a false prophet. I had been prophesying falsely because I was not declaring what the word of God said, I was declaring what my denomination and what a majority of ultra-dispensational pre-tribulation rapturists had been teaching basically to the American public for generations. This was my confession and also my declaration. The mystery of iniquity, the legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah. Now why I say legal prerequisites is because when God has given his word, he does not change it, unless he gives it conditionally. If you do this, then I will do that. That is conditional. But when he has given his word, when he says certain things are going to take place, that they must take place, and that they will take place, and the prophets have spoken of this, Yeshua himself and Paul and John have spoken of these things very specifically, then it is written. This is a revelation from heaven. As Paul said, I have received this by the word of the Lord. And he says, Basically, thus saith the Lord, thus saith Yehovah. And when God has given his word, he does not change it. That is why we can depend upon his word. We can understand what he says is going to come to pass. And these are the legal prerequisites. They will be fulfilled. They are required to be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled. Those are the words that are used in the scripture. In the introduction, I quote Martin Luther. If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved and to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace. Martin Luther, on October 31st, on All Saints Day, nailed the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg Castle. And those 95 Theses, for the most part, was challenging the provisions that were made for the selling of indulgences. Selling of indulgences so that people would contribute to the building of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, and by doing so, they could purchase the right to commit a sin in the future. For a certain amount of money, less than $5, you could commit murder in the future. For less than $3, you could rape a virgin and be forgiven of this. This to Martin Luther was absolutely outrageous. There were 95 things that he laid out that had to be challenged and he was attacking at that moment because that is where the perversion stood at that moment. He challenged a lot of things. This began the Reformation, but it didn't end the Reformation. There are so many things that have to be challenged, and for the most part, the Christian world is sound asleep. Nobody is going back to what the Word of God says. At least Martin Luther started on that. But now, we are going to take this to the next step. Because what the world and the devil are now challenging is not only destroying our country, it is destroying the church, it is destroying the believers because of the easy believism, the greasy grace, the sloppy agape, the anti-nominism, the anti-Torah, those who believe that the, the, the grace is a license to sin which has now permeated the entire Christian world. This started back in the first century. Paul had to deal with it. Jude deals with it. They deal with it when they're speaking to Titus and Timothy. This is 
reached its apex in the modern church age. What I'm going to do in this series is I am going to expose the heresy that has crept into the church that is destroying the Christian church today. Over the last two years, I've had a unique experience. Since moving back from Israel, I had a medical problem in which uh, I ended up uh, having a few strokes and so I had to have an operation. When I woke up from the operation, I was blind. I couldn't see anything for several days. And then finally, my eyesight started coming back. And at that point, when I was starting to recover, I, I knew that I just needed to be around believers. I needed to, to be around Christians. I needed to get back to where I was hearing the word of God because I couldn't read, I couldn't see, I couldn't write. I was writing everything backwards. I had to learn to write all over again. I couldn't type on my keyboard. Nothing made sense. My brain was not wired the same way. And so I went back to church and I wanted to be around believers, but I didn't want to be on. I needed to be around people that didn't know me from Adam. And so I could just go into a Sunday school class and sit there and open my Bible. And then I found after a few weeks because of the narrow columns that I could start to read again. But what I found I was appalled at. I'm sitting in a Sunday school class and I'm listening to the comments of the people all around and people are invited to share and it's a wonderful open sharing. And I realized that basically everyone is saying, well, this is what this verse means to me. This is what the Bible means to me. And I got so frustrated as I was listening to this and I just, I just wanted to you know, stand up and say, I don't care what it means to you. You are obviously an idiot. You have never read the scriptures. Now, I have read the scriptures my entire life. I've memorized the scriptures. I've, I've read the gospels more than any living human being alive today. I am sure of it because I've spent my whole life doing this. And as I'm listening to this, people are completely stripping these words out of context, having no relationship to what the word of God is communicating. And as these people are saying, this is what it means to me, I, 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 am, I, I am appalled at the biblical ignorance and these are people that are in this Sunday school class who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. This is a generation that was raised with the Bible, but yet their biblical ignorance, after having sat in church their whole lives, was so profound, I, 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 I was dumbstruck. I, I didn't know what to say. And this is what I saw. Over and over, the theme was, well, the Jews didn't get this. The Jews didn't get that. They're all the time talking about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, because uh, reading the Gospel of John, uh, as it says, the Jews did this, the Jews did that. You know, in the Gospel of John, it's basically, when it says the Jews, they're speaking of the Pharisee leaders. They're not talking about the rank and file people that are attending the synagogue that, that had been in place for 300 years in the land of Israel. No. They're, they're blaming the Jews and they blame the Jews because they didn't see the first coming of the Messiah. They are blaming the Jews for not understanding these few obscure verses in the Torah and the prophets, especially the prophets. There are a few verses and sections of scripture that speak of the Messiah as a suffering servant. 
and they're very cryptic. They're, they're not something that is very pronounced. And only in hindsight can you look at them and understand this is speaking of the Messiah. This is speaking of Yeshua. We can look back at it and easily see this now. But they didn't see this because that's not the main theme. They want to blame the Jews for not seeing him come the first time, but I'm telling you something, ladies and gentlemen, that the whole Christian world has missed his second coming already. They've already missed it. Why? When Yeshua was in the Nazareth synagogue, at the end of the week, on the Sabbath, that ended the week in which Shavuot started that week, Shavuot being the first day of the week. Now he's in the synagogue and he stands up and he reads from the scroll of Yeshayahu, Isaiah. And he reads this prophecy about the spirit of Yehovah is upon me to preach good tidings to the poor, to deliver the captives, to recovery of sight to the blind, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll. Every eye in the synagogue was focused on him. They were fastened on him because they know that he just broke the scripture reading rule of the synagogue. You can read on the Sabbath any portion of scripture when you are called up to read or you volunteer to read any portion of the scripture, but you must read an entire section. That way, it avoids people taking things out of context. Read an entire section. Today, in modern Judaism, it is called the three verse rule. You can read any section of scripture, the Torah or the prophets, but you must read at least three verses. Yeshua stops in the middle of the second sentence and says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and he closed the scroll. Everyone gasped. He just broke the three verse rule, so to speak. He didn't read the whole section. And then he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Why didn't he read the rest of the sentence? to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. That begins the next six chapters in which it speaks of the Messiah coming as the conquering reigning king who rules the earth with a rod of iron. This is a Messiah who we were expecting. This is the Messiah who we thought we really needed. The one who would deliver us from oppression. The one, as Isaiah said, who his garments would be soaked in blood. He would take vengeance on those that, that had persecuted and tribulated his people. He would relieve them from the pain and strain of the tribulation that they were going through. That Rome had completely dominated their culture. People were being butchered in the streets. 2,000 Jews were hung on crosses outside the north gate of the city of Jerusalem. That's what we were expecting. That was what we were hoping for. The suffering servant really wasn't the one that we thought was going to meet our needs. But this is the Messiah that we are expecting and all of Israel was expecting the conquering reigning king, Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The rulers of this earth, the kings of this earth conspire together against Jehovah and against his anointed saying, we won't be constrained by their rules and regulations. We'll bust them asunder. It says he that reigns in the heavens is gonna laugh. He's gonna have them in derision that his anointed, the Messiah, that he is anointed will break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He is going to rule them with a rod of iron. You better kiss the son and make up to him while you have the chance because when his wrath is kindled just a little, you are gonna be so, so sorry. For six chapters in the book of Isaiah, it is the, the Messiah coming 
with power and authority as he takes over the earth. And then he rules upon the earth for a thousand years. And all those who are on the earth will come up, all the nations will come up to Jerusalem to worship Yehovah Tzebaot, the king of kings, as he reigns from his throne in Jerusalem. That is what they were looking for. When all the earth is gonna be filled with the knowledge of God, that's what we were looking for. And that is what the entire Christian world has already dismissed. It doesn't even exist. Why? Because the Christian world has adapted some ridiculous fairy tale, Hallmark Channel Christianity, where people, they die and then they go to heaven. They, they stand at the gate and St. Peter reads whether they can get into heaven or not, and if he says they can't go into heaven, then they immediately go to hell. And then they, they, they get wings, they get a harp, and they get to sit on a cloud and sing songs, or they get to come back to earth and help us out. Whatever's happening, they get to go to heaven and then they look down upon us here on the earth and they help us out. That is absolute heresy. This is not the testimony of Yeshua. When people die, they don't become angels. I know the Mormons say that Moroni was this person who died and then he came back as an angel. That is absolute nonsense. Dead people are dead people. Angels are angels. They are not the same thing. Angels are created beings. They were created for a purpose. And people are people. They never become angels. Little children, when they die young, or when they're aborted by the millions in America, they don't become angels. They don't float around the sky. That's Scientology, okay? It has nothing to do with the Bible. Scientology is absolute craziness, as is Joseph Smith and his interpretation of what the Bible is. It's pure nonsense. I am going to take you through the mystery of iniquity. One of the constructs of the mystery of iniquity is the hidden, behind the scenes working of Satan as the God of this age, as Paul speaks of him. We need to understand what it is like in heaven at this hour. Because of all of this out there, that people go up to heaven and they see their grandmother, or they see their children, or they see their, their butterflies and their flowers, and, and that is not what it is like in heaven at this not time. This is not what it looks like. That has absolutely nothing to do with what the scripture says. Those who say that they have been to heaven and see their, their relatives and, and <sighs> that they're up there looking down on them, taking care of them, helping them out, or helping them win the, the score in the big football game, or sink the hoop in the, in the last second of the, of the ball game, this, this hallmark Christianity. No, if all of my relatives who are believers are up there looking down on me and helping me, then I, I'd say they're doing a really bad job because life is tough. Why? because people have taken numbered sound bites out of the scripture, they've taken a parable here or a sound bite there and they've mixed it all into a, a heavenly retreat and they have missed that the Messiah is going to come down upon this earth with his resurrected saints and he is going to live and reign on earth with his saints who reign as priests and kings with him for a thousand years. This is exactly what the prophets tell us. The expectation 
Zechariah was a prophet of God who spoke of these things, who spoke of the Messiah's reign upon the earth, and that every nation will go up to worship the king at his birthday party, the Feast of Tabernacles, and if the nations don't go up, it's not gonna rain on them for an entire year. These are the things that the prophets say, and we read about it in the book of Revelation because Yeshua then gives us the time frame and tells us the exact order in which all these things are going to take place. The mystery of iniquity, that term only appears once in the Bible, once, but it is rich, full of meaning. The mystery of iniquity is already at work and has been at work since Satan took his rebellious stand against God and subsequently man. We are going to get into the mystery of iniquity and understand in no uncertain terms that there are legal prerequisites. There are things that must take place before the Messiah returns. We are not going to miss it this time. We are not going to go up to heaven ahead of time. We are not going to preempt the resurrection in which he will raise the dead. And the the corrupted bodies will be given an incorruptible body. We are not going to preempt him changing our mortal body into a a mortal body, excuse me, a mortal body into an immortal body. We are going to wait for our savior, Yeshua, our Messiah, to return from heaven with the messengers of his might, and at the last trumpet, he is going to execute the mystery. That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. We must be born again, and at that moment when we are born again, and we are caught up to the sea of fire and glass, that is the day of victory. That is what we are looking forward to. 22 years ago, a prophet from the Assembly of God, a man that was notorious for his, not only his prophecies, but for the miracles that happened in his own ministry. Miracles that were reported in papers around the world. This pastor, Pastor Hansen, came up to Oregon where I was uh, living at the time and I had just completed uh, The Mystery of Iniquity a short time before that. And he came to a meeting where I was and I had heard about him before. And I was, I was uh, deeply moved that he would come to this home where I was speaking. And that night he told me that he came because he read The Mystery of Iniquity. And he told me that the Assembly of God pastors, that every year they have to sign a document that they believe and teach the pre-tribulation rapture. And if they didn't sign this document, they were defrocked, they were kicked out. He said, I read your book and I was convinced by the Holy Spirit that I must now come out of the closet on this very issue. That there are legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah, and what I have been swearing to and writing in this document year after year, I have known for years that it is a lie, it is false, that there is no pre-tribulation rapture, and I must come out of the closet. And so he said, what I want to do is I want to read your book on the air on my radio program. And so day after day, week after week, month after month, he read The Mystery of Iniquity and commented on it. Now, I'm not going to read The Mystery of Iniquity. There are portions that I would like to to read for you, but I really want to give you the, the details behind the scenes because I too was raised in a a dispensational world in which we had isolated numbered sound bites, we had isolated portions of time and we say, well this applies only to Jews, this applies only to Christians, because there is in the plain text of the scripture no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. It doesn't exist. 
And those who teach it, as I did, will tell you plainly that there is no pre-tribulation rapture in the plain text of the scripture. It can only be understood through a dispensational framework. A replacement theology framework. I believe that the Bible is the word of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. It is one story. It goes all the way through. From when we are evicted from the Garden of Eden and an angel stands with the flaming sword to keep us from the tree of life, Yeshua promises in the new heaven and new earth after the final judgment in which everyone who has not been previously judged for their faithfulness to him, everyone who's ever lived will be judged according to their works, and if their name is not written in the book of life, they are then cast into the lake of fire. Then there is a new heaven and a new earth, new Jerusalem, and in the midst of the city, there is a garden, a gone, a paradise, and what is in the midst of the garden? The tree of life. And the proclamation, from the Messiah is the curse has ended. The curse that kept us out of the garden, that kept us from the tree of life has now ended. There is no more sickness, there's no more death, there's no more disease, there's no more sin. Satan has been cast into the lake of fire and exterminated. And now we understand that This very thing from Genesis to Revelation is one story, and we are going to understand it as one story. As I read, continuing in the introduction, the mystery of iniquity, this book exposes and extinguishes the strong delusion that has become the false hope of the Christian church, the snare that has been set by Satan through many years of working behind the scenes. What began as gentle misleading has through the years taken a winding path to the valley of full deception. This is the warning of Yeshua, of Paul, of Yohanan, concerning the absolute prerequisite to the return of the Messiah to gather the saints at the rapture. This warning is not a long-range prophecy as it was in their day, but is reiterated in the context of the accomplished deception of the Christian church in the modern times. This is a final warning to America and the world as to what is impending and cannot be circumvented regardless of how one votes. This book documents the legal, legal ramifications of Satan's original rebellion his authority as God of this age, his rebellious stand on the earth, and his final revolt. This is how the long war against God will play out in our lifetime. Yes, these are the things that must take place before the rapture. Now, I've heard some people say that there is no rapture. Well, there's no rapture in their Bible because they're reading the King James Version of the Bible. There is rapture in the Latin text because it is a translation of the Greek, which it says, it speaks of the harpazo, the gathering together of the saints. When Yeshua is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Yeshua Messiah. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all be dead, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That is when the harpazo, the gathering together, takes place. The harpazo, which is translated into Latin as raptura, raptura, from which we get the word rapture. There is a gathering together of the saints. When Yeshua returns and raises the dead and changes the mortal into an immortal body, 
because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. As he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now I know the term born again has been completely destroyed by the modern Christian church. And we're gonna get into this in some detail because born again is not how the Bible describes what you do and what you get when you sing one more stanza of just as I am or some other invitational hymn, come forward and do a repeat after me prayer, and then get a Gospel of the John, which you go home and put it on your shelf, and now you're saved. You're going to hell and all hell can't stop you, as the Baptist preacher would say in the South. That is not what the scripture speaks of as born again. This is what the, the Gospel of Peter, the book of Peter speaks of as perhaps begotten again of incorruptible seed. The seed has been implanted, but that seed is supposed to grow. It's supposed to be nurtured. It's supposed to receive nutrients, the milk of the word, then the meat of the word. A concept completely foreign to the Christian world. There's no meat, there's hardly any milk. I had a, a, a revelation the other morning about this whole experience where people go forward and get saved just in case all this stuff about God is really true. And I recalled the last Billy Graham crusade that I went to up in Minnesota. And Billy Graham was getting old and he couldn't stand through the whole thing. He, he, he stood, he delivered the message, then he would sit down, then he'd go up and do the invitation, and he'd sit down, and, when he, and, and the message, uh, to be honest with you, I, I respect Billy Graham for what he, he did, but uh, again, he's old at this point. And his message was completely lackluster. There was no motivation, nothing in it that would cause people to respond in, in any way. But the people knew what to do. They knew what the cue was. They knew that when this song was sung, then they would get up out of their seats and they would go forward. And as I was sitting there watching this, people were just, they were chit-chatting away, they were laughing, and thousands and thousands of people emptied their seats and they were all going down to go forward and get saved because that's what the invitation was, come forward and get saved. And right then, in my mind, I became Billy Graham. I stood up in my mind in front of everyone, and I said, stop, stop, you people, stop. You have absolutely no idea what you're about to enter into. You have no idea what this is about. Yeshua said, if you wanna follow me, they are gonna hate and they're gonna kill me. They're gonna hate and come after you and they're gonna kill you too. If you wanna follow me, grab a cross. Grab an execution stake and get in line because they're coming after you. The world hates me, it's gonna hate you. You people that are walking forward right now, you better realize that your friends, your husbands, your wives, your coworkers, everyone is gonna hate you when you take a stand, when you start speaking the truth, when you start teaching what Yeshua taught. Because to be his disciples, Yeshua said, go out to the whole world, make disciples, and teach them what I taught you. And they're gonna hate you for it. See, in the book of Acts, people are dying left and right because he, they are teaching what he taught. They're not telling sweet baby Jesus stories. They're teaching what Yeshua taught. But my experience, nobody, nobody in any church I've been in has ever taught what Yeshua is teaching. They don't know what he taught. They think he's just, it's just an invitation. Like I hear in church all the time, how come the, the, the Jews in the Galilee didn't receive him a, a, as the Christ? It's like, what are you talking about? That wasn't the invitation. 
He didn't tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Oh, one Gentile woman at a well outside of Shechem, Samaria. A Samaritan Gentile woman. A woman that he told her everything he ever she ever did in her life. How she was married to these men and now the man she's with is not even her husband. And she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. I perceive that you're a prophet. And then she asked him a question and his answer she didn't really understand. So she answered like any Jew or Samaritan would answer when we either don't understand or don't agree with the person on a biblical matter. And she said to him, well, basically, I don't know what you just said, but I know when the Messiah comes, he's gonna tell us all things. Yeshua looked her dead in the eye and said, you're looking at him, sweetheart. She dropped her water pot, ran back into the city. and said, is not this the Messiah? He told me everything I ever did in my whole life. The people of the city came out and they heard what he had to say and they, they commented, said, we heard what the woman said, we didn't believe her, we've heard your words, we know you are the Messiah. You are the savior of the world. That is the one in the only time that he ever told anyone or ever allowed anyone to say that he was a Messiah. Every other time he forbid them. And it wasn't until the second chapter of the book of Acts on the day of Shavuot that Peter stood up with hundreds of thousands of people gathered together in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount who had just heard them speak in tongues the wonderful works of God in their own native languages scattered over all these countries now converging on Jerusalem. And he then testified of Yeshua. This Yeshua whom you have crucified, you have slain, God has raised him from the dead. And this Yeshua has Yehovah made both Lord and Messiah. That is the first time that Peter or any of the apostles, anyone was allowed to declare that he was a Messiah on the day that they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the first and only time. So you wanna understand why the Jews didn't accept him as, as the, the Christ? And, and because he wasn't being declared as the Christ, as the Messiah. What they did, they declared him just as Moses said, there is going to come another one. Like me, like Moses who hears directly from heaven, he will not speak his own words, he will speak only that which he hears from heaven. And he will speak my words. And everyone, the people, all of Israel is required to Shema, to hear and obey him. And if they don't hear and obey him, then they will be judged. And this is what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Those who do not shema, do not hear and obey him, will be destroyed. Destroyed because that is in the end of the book of Revelation. All those whose names are not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. This is the time of Yeshua doing the judging. Now, I've got other things to say on this, but we know that on YouTube and on the different social media platforms that we are being restricted from what we say. I have been restricted on Christian television. They have kept me from saying what I want to say. We're gonna hear it right straight from Yeshua. I'll see you. 